All right, this is number two, session number two on 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 28. And I said last time that it is an attempt to deal with one of the most puzzling things in the uh, letters of Paul. So I want to just pray right off the bat, Father, I need your help. We need your help because this is complicated. And I pray and hope it will be biblical, that is, faithful to all that you are teaching in the text that we are looking at, and that you would give us, all of us who are participating right now, a great attention, great discernment, a great humility, and teachability, and open our eyes to see what you're telling us about being found blameless at the day of Christ. I ask this in Jesus' name. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless, kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you read kept blameless, it sounds like, well, in some sense, we are blameless because of our relation to Christ, and he's asking, that God would keep us that way so that we are found that way at the coming of the Lord Jesus. But the problem is, this phrase right here says, God, sanctify them completely. Sanctify the Thessalonians. Sanctify John Piper completely, because he's not yet completely sanctified. So if I'm not yet completely sanctified and I need some work done on me, then in what sense am I being kept blameless? That's the question. How does God keep us, make us, fit us to be blameless so that when the Lord Jesus comes, we will not be found with a damning blame in our lives? And this sanctifying them completely seems to be, and I'll show that in fact is, a part of the process by which this happens so that you can't reduce, keep them blameless, you can't reduce that to imputed righteousness through justification. I'll explain. Is there a category in Paul's letters, or in this letter, for a blamelessness that is not yet perfect? Yes. Chapter 2, verse 10, you are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Paul's claiming to be blameless in his conduct toward the Thessalonians, and we know from Philippians 3, he did not believe he was perfect or sinless. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. I'm not yet perfect. Paul was not a perfectionist. He believed that he had need every day of forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So jump back to 1 Thessalonians 3 to see how the process of sanctification relates to being found blameless at the day of Christ. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and for all as we do for you so that. So this increase and abounding is the means by which this effect is brought about. What effect? So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord. So this blamelessness is not merely the imputation of Christ's blamelessness to us because it's made the product of a growing love for believers. It, this blamelessness here is related to the process of sanctification. Lord, make them increase and abound in love so that this will happen. Or, same thing in Jude 24, 124. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. So he, God is able to keep you from stumbling, stumbling into unbelief and a life of sin and thus to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So this presentation before God of us as blameless 
is effected by his keeping us from stumbling. This is not merely imputation. This is somehow practical keeping from a life of stumbling that enables him to present us blameless. Here it is again in Philippians 1. And it is my prayer that your love, your love may abound. So he's praying for practical increases of love more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that, here's the love that's going to have this effect, so that you may approve what is excellent and so, by that love, that abounding, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Over and over, Paul says, we're going to be found blameless at the day of Christ but it's going to be, in some sense, the effect of a growth in love, a growth in sanctification. Now, how does it relate to reconciliation and justification? Colossians 1. You, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. So, the death of Christ did what needed to be done for our sins to be forgiven, for the wrath of God to be taken away, and sinners are now, by faith, in the death of Jesus, reconciled. We are done with guilt. We are done with wrath. We are at home with the Father. We are in the family. We are reconciled to God in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him Indeed, if you continue, if indeed you continue in the faith, it was faith that reconciled us to God. As we continue in the faith, we are kept and thus remain at peace in this reconciliation. And that's the foundation of our being presented blameless. Now, how are we going to put all this together? One more text. 1 Corinthians 1 7 9. You wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you. He will sustain you to the end. There's a sustaining work, a confirming work, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son. He's faithful, and the faithfulness of God means this sustaining and keeping is going to happen, and therefore we are going to be found guiltless, blameless, at the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there seem to be two kinds of blamelessness going on, right? So you've got being kept blameless in our text here. It says, as if we have it, and he's going to make sure that he keeps it true. And yet, there's a sanctification that needs to be completed in order to enjoy this. All right, I'm going to put it all together. (laughs) <laughs> you you take this as slowly as you want. There's no rush here, and there's no attempt to twist any arms. I'm just doing my best to put the pieces of Paul's thinking together into a glorious whole of assurance and holiness. Some people emphasize assurance and don't emphasize any demand for holiness. And some people emphasize holiness and go light on the assurance of justification by faith. Well, let's see if we can put it together. Christ died. So I'm going to number these. These are my steps. The meaning of being kept blameless at the day of Christ. This is my attempt to understand what we just saw. One, Christ died for us. Praise God. That's the foundation of everything. If he had not died, then there could be no hope whatsoever that we would be found acceptable and blameless at the day of Christ. But he did die for us. Number two, by the Holy Spirit, we are brought to faith. Number three, through that faith, we are reconciled to God. So the reconciliation is purchased here, it's experienced here, and we are in it. And this reconciliation means wrath is removed, Sin is forgiven, righteousness is imputed, and we are perfect in Christ. 
We are all that Christ is for us as we are united to him by faith. That unleashes, fourth, the process of becoming what we are. Sanctification, actually becoming holy in practice, hating sin, putting it to death, fighting the fight of faith, pursuing obedience, striving. Yes, that does result from being reconciled. You don't say, oh, I'm reconciled, I can go on sinning. You're not reconciled if you love sin and pursue sin as though nothing has happened. So, it unle- this reconciliation unleashes the process of sanctification. It begins. Five, thus we are blameless in two senses. We are, we'll call this A, counted righteous in Christ because of this reconciliation, and we are counted righteous in Christ and confirmed in that righteousness in Christ by holiness of life, by growing holiness of life. Call that uh, B. So two senses of blameless. One, in Christ we are counted perfect. And two, our being in Christ is confirmed by holiness of life. There is a holiness without which we will not see the Lord, Hebrews 12, 14. And that now moves us to, what number are we at? Five, six, no, we're six. No, we're we're going to do six. Okay, six. God keeps us imperfectly believing and holy. God keeps us. So right now, when I think of being kept by God, I believe I wake up in the morning a believer because God is keeping me. I believe I get some victory over temptation during the day because God is keeping me. And I don't, pl- I don't claim to have perfect faith, and I don't claim to have perfect holiness, but it's real, and it's real, and it's owing to God keeping me. And thus, we are confirmed by that imperfect believing in holiness. We are confirmed by God as perfectly blameless in Christ for the day of Christ. Now, if that went by too fast, I encourage you to just push stop and uh, pause and walk it through carefully. Go back and check the texts. But that's my conclusion as to what it means to be kept blameless for the coming of our, or at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am blameless in two senses. I am in Christ by faith and thus reconciled to God with the blamelessness of Christ counted as mine. And I am being sanctified completely, which is a necessary confirmation of being in Christ. And thus we will be safe at the coming of our Lord Jesus.